the creation topic, third and final week. So I thank you for coming back. Does everybody have a handout that wants one? If not, raise your hand and we'll make sure you have one. All right, we're good to go then. Okay. Let me just kind of, kind of set the context for where we're going tonight. Week number one, we looked at the creation of everything, everything that you can touch, feel, and see. We, we looked at, at God in the grandeur of the universe and the precision of the universe to support life. We looked at God in the individual cells, the complexity of the cells that was absolutely contradictory to what Darwin was expecting to see as technology evolved. And then in week two, we looked at something that was even more astounding than those things, and that was what it meant to be created in the likeness and image of God. And what we're going to see tonight is kind of how it all went wrong. We're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 3. But let me lay the context of that right before, and I want to start with a very brief video here. But it deals with what's right and what's wrong. And if you think about the world in which Adam and Eve were put in, they were put in a world that was perfect. There was no evil. There was no sin. God prepared a special garden. What was the name of the garden? Garden of Eden. A special garden for them to live, especially made for mankind. They had a very deep and very personal relationship with God. We talked about that last week, what it means to be part of the image of God, the oneness between God and man. I believe that that relationship was closer than any relationship any of us have ever experienced. I think that relationship between Adam, Eve, and God was closer than mother and child. I believe it was closer than the closest married couple. I believe it was closer even than that of Adam and Eve themselves, and the Bible tells us that they were so close that they were one. So they enjoyed a relationship with God like we cannot fathom today. But it went bad in Genesis chapter 3. So it deals with this issue around right versus wrong. And we're going to have some discussion tonight about how do you know what's right? How do you know what's true? What is truth? And what I want to show you here is a, is a small video clip from a, from a study that I've done years ago. It's called The Truth Project. And this is interviewing a group of people from various backgrounds, and they're answering the question, what is right and what is wrong? And how do you know what is right? What is right and what is wrong? Okay, how do I determine right from wrong? Well, <laughs> depends how you look at it. Oh, how can we explain it? Weigh the pros and the cons, I suppose. How do I do it? I just, you know it. Some people, what's right to them isn't right to other people. I purely believe that it's the way you're brought up. I think partly it's what my parents told me were right and wrong. I determine right from wrong, well, based on if I would do it with my mom in the room. <laughs> I think that is a very big part of it. If my mom was in the room, I, I would not do the wrong things, or I would do them very quickly. I think we have an internal clock that tells us right from wrong. Man will either be governed by force or by the wills of his own heart. Cheating on your wife with adultery, yeah, not a good idea. If you do bad things, you're, just not, you're not gonna be liked. I always judge by my religion first, and then I see if it's right or wrong. As a Unitarian Universalist, since we're a non-credal religious tradition, we don't have a set doctrine to which to turn to look for a specific answer. Murdering people in cold blood is not a good idea for a civil society. Not stealing is a good idea. Coveting or envy, it's good mental health, but certainly there are, there are valuable things to be derived from 
the Ten Commandments. We might turn to some scripture from the Hebrew Bible or from the New Testament, Buddhist sutras. We might turn to the Quran. We might turn to Tao Te Ching from Taoism. Um, all of these things might be sources of authority. I don't think that you can say that something's definitely right and something's definitely wrong. There can't be two contradicting laws of the universe. If you do something and you feel guilty about it, I suppose, that would mean that, it, that for you it was something wrong. Not everybody has the same set of rules they play by. The way I live, I don't care if other people don't agree with me. It's my opinion. And, and that's the way I live, and if I ain't hurting you. There has to be some law, otherwise there's anarchy. My favorite was the guy that said, committing adultery on your wife, probably not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, if, 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 if you watch the study in his conclusion, you'll find he's, he's an engineer and he, he is an atheist. And uh, so I was not surprised that he would have that, have that view. So this question of what is right and what is wrong, is something that goes back to the garden. I mean, we all know the story of Adam and Eve and how, how, we, how they made the wrong choice. But we're going to look at it like we've done the other two weeks in a little different light, maybe in a little more detail than, than maybe you've studied in the past. So as you have some insights into what we study, please share them. If you've got some of the really hard questions, ask Linda, and I'll ask her to stand up and answer them. Okay. All right, so as we, uh, as we get started, let's set the context before we get into Genesis 2. Let's look at what God had done and what God commanded Adam. And then Adam passed this down to Eve. So God's instruction is how I have this la labeled. And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. How clear is God's command to Adam? Pretty clear. Why do you think God put the tree? in the garden at all? This is as easy as the questions get, by the way. Free will. Somebody else? To test Adam and Eve? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody else? These are right. Anybody else? Gave them a choice. Yeah, if they weren't allowed to make a choice, they would be like a robot. And I think that is absolutely the essence of why the tree is put in the garden. Why the tree of knowledge of good and evil? Kind of a strange name for a tree. That's not in your notes, by the way. We'll talk about that more later. If you go back to our studies previously, we've talked about why did God create humans? And if you remember back to our 111 rollout, we talked about God created us to love us. And he wants us to choose to love him back. Without the, without the tree in the garden, man would have had no choice to not love God. Okay? So my... my Here's going to be my summary of the, of the tree. It is there so that we can choose to love God or we can choose not to love God. Okay? That's why the tree is there. Okay? Now, there's also some words that I want to point out here. God said, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. My interpretation of that is God's saying, Go, have a good time, be fruitful, multiply, let's commune together, let's socialize together, let's just have a, let's have a good time together 
I've given you all these wonderful things. Enjoy. Okay? That's my, that's my interpretation of freely. Freely partake. But there's this one tree that I want you to stay away from because it's poison. As soon as you eat, you will die. Okay? So this was the command. Now let's get into where it starts going really bad really quickly. Genesis chapter 3. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? So here we see Satan walking to Eve, taking the fruit. And I know it's not an apple, all right? But he comes up to Eve and says, God has told you, you can eat of every tree of the garden. Take a bite. Hadn't God said that? Take a bite. What does Eve response? Eve says, and the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of, fr but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Eve kind of got it right, didn't she? But I think there's some subtleties in here that tell us Satan had gotten her attention. Number one, she was listening to him. Okay. Next, she said, here's going to be my interpretation of the, of the tone that she had, okay? This is, this is my interpretation. She was basically saying, yeah, God said we could eat all that stuff over there in that little bitty garden. You know, that fruit doesn't look nearly as good as what you're holding. Yeah, he said we could eat all that, but the, but the, but the fruit of the tree that is at the center of the garden that looks the best, he said we can't eat that. Matter of fact, he said we can't touch it. God never said you couldn't touch it. So I think Eve's tone here, Satan has planted a small seed that is causing her to challenge what she believes to be true. Okay. We're going to talk about this idea of truth tonight. Okay? Any questions? Comments? All right. It's early yet. The deception. Then the serpent said to the woman, you're not going to die. You know why God doesn't want you to eat of that tree? I mean, Eve, you're not so gullible to think that God is keeping that from you without a good reason, do you? I mean, the reality is, God knows that as soon as you take a bite of that fruit, you're going to be like him. Eve, you eat this fruit, you're going to get a promotion. Eve, you're not so gullible that you believe that God's not hiding something from you, do you? Are you? Are you that gullible? Doesn't say all that, does it? I kind of believe that's the way it happened. Eve now has a choice to make. She's got all the facts in front of her. On the one side, she's got God who said, don't eat. This is a God that she communes with every day. She knows very well. He says, eat everything you want except this tree. On the other side, she's got Satan. And she's saying, who's telling me, I can eat everything. As a matter of fact, if I eat of this special tree, I get promoted. I will be like God. She has a choice to make. She has a decision to make. Who is she going to believe? 
didn't know that Satan's evil. Doesn't know that Satan. Wow, uh, here. How's that? Can I have just can I have just a hand mic? Uh, here we go. All right, where was I? Okay. He's got a choice to make. She has to decide who she going to believe. Who's telling me the truth? What does she know about God at this point? You know, some people will ask, how long did Adam and Eve live in the garden before this happened? The reality is we don't know. But I, I think it's pretty safe to assume that it's not a very long period of time because they had no children, or at least none that are recorded. So what does she know about God? What does she know about God? Gave her lots of good stuff. Yeah, what else? Only what Adam had told her, okay? There's a greed factor, yeah. Must have. Must have. Mm -hmm. They were innocent. They were naive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They had they had experienced good, right? They had never experienced evil. Yes, are you saying Eve was not accountable for her decision? Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. She knew. Yeah. They saw him every day. They knew what he looked like. They knew what he sounded like. They knew, she, she knew that he provided everything for her. She knew that. She was close to God. Yet, that little seed of doubt caused her to question everything that she knew to be true. Guys, if you think about, if you think about the truth being like a like a candle if i had a candle in my hand here and it is the truth can it ever get dark enough so that you can't see the light of the candle it can never get so dark that it consumes the light as a matter of fact the darker it gets the brighter the candle shines unless something obstructs the light Satan is obstructing the light of the truth of God he is causing Eve to question what she knew to be true how many lies do we believe do we believe any lies do we believe any lies You know, go ahead. You know, God wants to prosper you, doesn't he? God wants you to be prosperous. 
go ahead and cheat on your income tax. God wants you to have, the, the government doesn't need more of your money anyway. Don't they get enough? Nobody will know. Take a bite. God doesn't care what you do in your free time as long as you don't hurt anybody else. Nobody will ever know. Take a bite. Hmm. I think there's lies that every one of us in this room tonight, even Christian people, fall to every day. As a matter of fact, if you look into, in John, and I'm not going to go here, I've gone here in previous lessons, but when Jesus was standing before Pontius Pilate, right before he was to be crucified, He answered Pilate with something that goes similar to this. Pilate was asking if he was a king, and why did he come? And Jesus said, for this reason, I came into the world. For this reason, I was born to testify to the truth, to show you what is true, what is really real. And I think it's interesting that most of the translations call it testify or bear witness to the truth. Because, guys, I believe even in Jesus' day, absolutely in our day, the truth is on trial. The truth is obscured. And we have to be very diligent to make sure that we don't buy in to the lies. Okay. And I am way off script here. Any comments? Kevin says, even before the serpent or Satan, that there was temptation in the garden. That's the one you're going to have to hold for Derek. Yeah. Mm Yeah, so Adam and Eve kind of like kids here. Okay. I believe that Eve made the choice that she made, a full conscious choice. It wasn't a reaction. It was a deliberate choice. She knew that God loved her. She knew that he provided for her. She knew that she gave, he gave her a spouse that loved her very much. But then she wanted more, or thought she did. What's that? Right, I, I, I get that. I, I, right. She made a conscious choice. And, the, and what Satan caused her to question, she said, I love God, but should I? Is he as loving as I think he is? Is he hiding something from me? Is God keeping me from becoming my full potential? And she concluded that he was. What's that question? Yeah, so not only did she listen to Satan, she believed Satan. Yeah. Yeah.
I think she questioned God's goodness. Satan caused her to question God's goodness. How many times when things go poorly for us do we question God versus praise him for his goodness? Ah, ouch. All right, so the fall. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate also. And the eyes of them were opened. In other words, they now had knowledge of evil. So here's the question I want us to ponder over for just a moment. The second before she bit the apple, did she believe it was wrong? Did she know it was wrong? What do you think? Ah, who did she believe? Ah. They knew what God said was right and what was wrong. Mm -hmm. Not a simple question. What's that? Nobody wants to believe God? Yeah. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, he just plainly told them. But again, who did she believe? Did she believe what, what she had experienced with God? Or did she believe what Satan had told her? She believed what Satan said, so she believed that when she took that bite the instant before, she thought she was doing the right thing. She didn't believe she was doing the wrong thing because she believed a lie. Guys, we got to be careful. No matter how deeply you believe a lie, it's still a lie. That's the reason I said the instant before the first bite. Okay? Guys, the, the hijackers on 9-11 deeply believed that what they were doing was right. They believed it so deeply, they died for it. But they believed the lie. How many lies do we believe? All right. What's that, Mark? Yeah, I don't know. You know, Mark is saying, you know, if she, she touched it and nothing happened, then she took the bite and thought, oh, gosh, I did something wrong. So what was her first reaction after she knew she'd done something wrong? He go at him. <laughs> Take a bite. <laughs> That's women for you. What's that? Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe not. I think they knew. That, I think they knew that God told them not to do it, and that it would be bad if they did. The thing is, she chose not to believe God. She believed Satan and believed the lie. All right. So Eve had this crushing desire that none of us have, fortunately, and this was a desire for more. She wanted more. Hmm. And I'm glad that none of you have the desire to have more. She had this desire to be more significant. She had this drive to live to her fullest potential. Satan used that drive, significance for self, to cause her to believe the lie. What's that? 
She certainly committed the one deadly sin, that's for certain, for all of us, right? So guys, the lie that's out in front of us every day, I said, we all believe lies. And it's the lie that it's all about you. How many of our actions do you look around? You, you, nobody in this room, obviously, okay? So the people out here, how many of their actions can you attribute to, it's all about me? Take care of number one. A lot of times it's easy to believe the lie. And I really got to move. So, let's talk about truth versus lies. Can you tell the difference? I want to throw out some scenarios. You tell me whether this is truth or whether it's a lie. If I buy a sports car, it will make me joyously happy. Is that truth or is that a lie? How many think it's a lie? How many of you think it's a truth? <laughs> got two in the back here that are heathen, pray for them. It's a lie. If I have a million dollars in the bank, I will be happy. Is that a lie? Is that a truth? Partial truth. <laughs> okay, okay. Hang with me here. Hang with me here. You should do good for your enemies. Is that a truth or is that a lie? I mean, we'd say that's a truth. Yeah. If I were to ask one of our young folks, Taylor, to come up here. You can stay seated. But if I were to say, you know, Taylor, I like you a lot. And, you know, I've got, in my 49 years on this earth, I've developed a, a level of wisdom. And I'm going to share that wisdom with you. Taylor, the advice that I would have for you is you should look deep within yourself. Find out who you really are. Find out who you really are and follow your dreams. Follow the desires of your heart. Go. Did I just give Taylor good advice? Follow your heart. How many of you say, that's good advice? You're afraid, aren't you? You're afraid to answer on this one. This is not as easy. How many of you would say, follow your heart? Uh, uh, I'm not going to give you any more information than that. Taylor, follow your heart, bud. I'm right behind you. Good advice or not? How many would say that's a truth? How many would say that's a lie? How many of you don't know? Yeah. Yeah. What does the Bible say about the heart of man? It is desperately wicked. It cannot be trusted. You may have heard of Abraham Maslow. He came up with this psychological a way to, to view human behavior. And he became famous for what is called the uh, human hierarchy of needs. Okay, and he talks about, you know, you've, the first level is security and safety, and it builds up. And the very top pyramid that should be the goal of every human being 
he called self-actualization, and it is following your inner desires, becoming what you are called to be, trusting your inner self. Big, big lie. I want to study that a little more. How many of you have ever given, don't raise your hand on this one, how many of you have ever given advice similar to what I gave Taylor? Follow your heart. Trust your instincts. Be all that you can be. All that came from Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which has no clinical evidence, by the way. So guys, this idea of understanding what is true and what is a lie is not always obvious. How do we know? Hold that thought. So let's get back to Eve. So they both eaten the forbidden fruit. And here, they hear God walking in the cool of the day. And God comes looking for them. And I'm going to pick up the scripture in verse 11. And he said, he being God, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded that you should not eat? Then the man said, the woman whom you gave me, who, who you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So like any good human, what did they say? It's not my fault. Adam was so brazen as to say, God, it's your fault because you gave me this woman. All right. This is the kind of culture that we see today where a, where a woman can get burnt by hot coffee and sue McDonald's for millions of dollars. We lack accountability. So yeah, it's not my fault. So what would, how did God react to that? Anybody know? He didn't. So then we get into the world is now in a fallen state. The world has now experienced evil. The world is now a very different place. I have read this scripture for many years. Matter of fact, Genesis is probably the most read book in the Bible because everybody at some point says, I'm going to read the Bible through, and they start with Genesis. Few actually get through it. But everybody's probably read the first few chapters of Genesis. I've read it many times. What I'm about to talk to you about did not hit me until I was preparing for the, um, uh, when I was teaching this in the 20-something the, uh, the class. And let me just read this to you, and I want to talk about it for a minute. This is, this is the verses immediately after the fall of mankind, instantly. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly, belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Enmity means conflict or hatred, okay? And guys, let me tell you, this is not about women not liking snakes, okay? It is much deeper than that. So, who is the seed of the woman? Anybody know? Jesus Christ is the seed. In the New King James Version, it is a capital S. And I think it's a, uh, a pretty awesome thing that the verse immediately, immediately after the fall, God's already talking about the way back. He's, uh, this is the first prophecy of the coming Messiah. So God knew that we had broken the connection with him. His justice, we had to be punished. But his love 
required him to provide a way back. And guys, everything in human history that has happened, everything in your Bible from Genesis chapter 3 through the end of Revelation happens because of this, what happened in Genesis 3. The rest of the story is written. Let me just diverge here just a, just a moment. The Old Testament can be pretty tough reading. For those of you who are doing the read through the Bible, it's some pretty tough stuff, okay? Everything you see there is what God did to get us to Jesus. I'm getting into Keith's opinion here. We talk, we, we've often heard and been taught that Israel is the chosen nation, and they are. Why are they the chosen nation? Anybody have an opinion before I give you mine? That's where Jesus comes from. That's the lineage of Jesus. A few chapters forward in Genesis, we'll hear about Noah and the flood. And right before that, it says that man had digressed to the point that every thought of his heart was evil all the time. I've often had the question, so why didn't God just wipe us out completely and start all over? Why did he save one family? Because that's where Jesus would come from. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So guys, this idea of the Redeemer and the love of God of Jesus Christ. Jesus is in Genesis chapter 3. Okay, pretty awesome. What about this bruising head and heel stuff? Let me just give you the summary, since I am running just a touch behind. This is really a prophecy that Jesus would be injured by Satan. Think crucifixion. But in the end, Jesus would destroy Satan, crush his head, as, as some interpretations would say. So this is a, a prophecy of the crucifixion, resurrection of Jesus, and eventual destruction of Satan okay. in Genesis 3, the verse after the fall. Okay, so now let's look at the consequences. You can read the rest of chapter 3, and I encourage you to do that, but in, in verse 22, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, to know good and evil. And now lest he put out his hand and take also of the tree of life, and eat, and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. The garden especially created for Adam and Eve. They were now banished from the garden. They were banished from the tree of life. The tree of life was what would have allowed Adam and Eve to live forever. So my question for you I would like for you to think about was this act of God from separating Adam and Eve from the tree of life an act of mercy or an act of punishment? You understand the difference, right? Anybody got an opinion on that? Maybe a little bit of both? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that one on the side of punishment. Anybody else? Bingo. I believe this is absolutely an act of mercy. I think you're seeing God say in a very sad tone, mankind and I are now separated. He is living in a sinful state. I don't want him to live forever. 
in that state. So out of my mercy, I am going to allow his life to end at some point. Yes. Yeah, that's a great point. T Tammy's saying that many times as a parent, you will do things that seem harsh to a child that is for that child's betterment in the long run, and that is exactly where I wanted to take this. God wanted us to seek redemption. He knows he's going to provide a, re a, a way back, a way back to Eden, if you'll have that. And he wants us to desire that relationship. Until they were banned from the garden. Of course, I'm absolutely right. That, that, that's right. That's right. Okay, let me let me move on. So, guys, I'm going to bring this to conclusion, and I'm going to take this into a section that I'm calling. What do we carry forward? We talked last week about what it means to be created in the image of God and fallen man. Let me go ahead and give you the blanks here. Oops. Fallen, man, fallen people still carry the image of God. Okay? We, we have the image of God, but because of the fall, we also have what is called a sin nature. And I just want to talk about that for just a moment. So let me back up and read in, um, in Romans. And this is, this is Paul speaking, and this gets kind of complicated, okay? And this is, this is a super Christian talking, okay? This is maybe the greatest Christian of all time saying this. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin, but sin that dwells in me. And then he continues, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. God's we will always, until we pass, carry the sin nature. And what Paul is saying is, I know what I'm supposed to do. I don't do it. I know what I'm supposed not to do, but I do that anyway. But through the grace of Jesus Christ, he protects me from that. Okay. We, are, we are taught to constantly battle the sin nature, but we will never completely defeat it until we are transformed at our passing. So guys, let me, let me bring this to conclusion. We've got to constantly look and search for truth what is real, what is true. We look to that truth where? Where should we look for that truth? God's Word. God's Word to us. Many of you have it in your lap right now. It is God's Word to us. It is complete. There is no problem that you will have no issue that you will face where God is silent in his word. You don't get it by sleeping on it. You get it by reading it. You get it by studying it. You get it by coming to classes and, 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 and diligence and understanding 
what is truth. Next week, Tony is going to pick up and tell you why you can absolutely trust the truth of God's Word. Absolutely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, you can trust God's Word. It is the source of truth. Guys, regardless of what I believe, regardless of the opinion that I have, I've got to validate those things. What I believe in my opinion has got to be balanced against what does the Word say. And you know what? If the Word says something different than what I believe, I need to change what I believe. If it's contrary to my opinion, I need to change my opinion. Okay. Any last comment before I dismiss you? Guys, I have absolutely um, enjoyed my three weeks here um, uh, talking about creation. I am very excited about uh, the, the future topics. And again, next week is the trustworthiness of the Word of God. I think it's going to be about three weeks, Tony. So it'll be another three weeks on that. Guys, don't miss. This is, this is really foundational, exciting stuff. So thank you for coming. Uh, if you have any questions that you, wanna, you didn't want to bring up in, in, in front of everyone, I'll be here for a little while. So I'll be glad to talk to you. Thank you. You're dismissed.